like us, they must learn it. Now, here's the interesting thing. There seems to be something special about birds learning directly from other birds. Consider these laboratory findings. If a young zebra finch does not have direct visual contact with a tutor, it won't learn to sing properly. Not only that, the preference for the zebra finch song can be overridden if a Bengalese finch feeds it and sings to it. And this, white crowned sparrows will reject an audio recorded version of another species song, but they will readily adopt it if it's sung by a live tutor. Even the critical learning period is affected by social interaction. A barn owl's window for song learning ends at 50 days, but this period can be extended the more the owl directly interacts with singing adults. Humans aren't much different. Perhaps you've heard of the sad case of Jeannie, who was physically, emotionally, and socially neglected by her parents for the first 12 years of life. Essentially, she grew up in isolation. When she was rescued by social workers, she had no language abilities. Although she did eventually learn to speak, it was significantly impoverished. And recall that the social limitations of children with autism spectrum disorder make it difficult for them to learn language in a typical pattern. In contrast, you also know about the deaf children of hearing parents who create their own sign language. Why do they do this? It's because their need for social interaction is so strong that it overcomes their lack of conventional language input. So let's talk more about this highly social brain. How do human brains connect to other human brains? What role does social information play in the brain's processing of language? And will our drive to be social ever be satisfied by something other than real life humans? Let me set up this lecture with a little historical context. Traditionally, many psychologists and neuroscientists have they've studied social interactions by focusing mainly on the individual as the appropriate unit of analysis. So the question has been, what's inside an individual's head that allows for social communication with others? But towards the latter part of the 20th century, scientists interested in highly complex social activities like language began expanding this narrow focus. Instead of zooming in on the individual, many now focus on the social activity per se. The appeal of this approach was nicely captured nearly 100 years ago by the eminent American psychologist Robert Woodworth. Way ahead of his time, in 1924, Woodworth gave us this to ponder. Two boys between them lift and carry a log which neither could move alone. You cannot speak of either boy as carrying half the log, nor can you speak of either boy as half carrying the log. The two boys coordinating their efforts upon the log perform a joint action and achieve a result which is not divisible between the component members of this elementary group. This is a simple example, but there are countless more complex ones. Uh, a team of surgeons operating, tango dancers dancing, a, a quarterback throwing to a receiver, jazz musicians improvising, carpenters building a house, lawyers building a case. As with the log example, it doesn't make sense to say that each dancer is doing half a tango, or each surgeon is only partially operating. The real action is one level up. Does this sound familiar to you? This is the essence of emergentism. The idea is that you can't reduce truly joint activity to its constituent parts because the parts combine to create something that goes beyond their sum. It's just like how heart cells aggregate to pump blood and ants solve problems together that they couldn't solve alone. So let's turn to the neural mechanisms that allow these joint activities to emerge. Do you recall simulation theory? That's the idea that the brain processes something by reactivating the parts involved in directing, directly experiencing it. For example, think about holding an apple and then taking a bite. As you do this, you're activating the same brain network that is actually involved in you seeing, holding, and tasting a real apple. 
Now, do the same thing, but this time, think about a friend taking a bite of an apple. So what'd your brain do there? You guessed it, the same basic network is active. So there's not much neural difference between when you bite an apple, imagine it, or imagine someone else doing it. This sort of shared simulation has been shown in many fMRI studies done by Mark Generod and John Desity, and it suggests a possible neural mechanism for how people subjectively understand the perspectives and actions of others. At this point, let me pause and address something that, that might have occurred to you. I bet some of you are wondering how your brain can tell apart simulation and reality. Despite the uncanny neural similarity between simulating actions and actually experiencing them, Desity has identified an additional neural network spanning the parietal and frontal lobes that monitors the difference between the two experiences. This is a very important network. When it's not working properly, due to pharmacology or psychosis, it can become nearly impossible to distinguish your own thoughts from what's actually happening in the world. Okay, so let's return to understanding the perspectives and actions of others. What we've got is a simulation theory that can explain more than just what happens in individual heads. The theory also includes how two heads get linked as one. Probably the most well-known mechanism for making these neural links comes in the form of mirror neurons. Originally discovered in the prefrontal cortex of monkeys by Giacomo Risolati, the mirror neuron system in humans is activated both when you produce an action, like reaching for an object, and also observe someone else produce that same action. Over the years, our understanding of the function of this mirror neuron system in humans has greatly expanded. Not only do we know it's responsible for understanding the, the intentions of actions or feeling the pain of others, it's now also being implicated in autism spectrum disorder, psychopathy, altruism, and even addiction. Some researchers, such as V.S. Ramachandran, predict that the discovery of mirror neurons will earn Risolati the Nobel Prize. So needless to say, there's a lot of excitement around them. There's also a lot of confusion. One of the most misunderstood aspects is where they come from. Are they innate or a product of learning? Here's where the 3D framework can be useful. Let's take the motor mirror system as an example. When very young infants view re the reaching behaviors of others, the mirror system won't be triggered. That's because infants must first have enough experience over development to master reaching for themselves. Only when reaching becomes part of their own motor repertoire can they activate mirror properties of the neurons. And only a fraction of the motor neurons have mirror properties. So it seems that just a subset of them have innate mirroring potential. In this way, the answer of where mirror neurons come from requires us to consider mechanisms on multiple levels and different time frames. The system is the product of genes conserved over evolution and plasticity and experience over development. To illustrate the role of experience, let me share with you one of my favorite experiments on the human mirror system. It's a 2004 study by Beatrice Calvo Marino, Patrick Haggard, and their team in London. Their subjects were professional dancers. It went like this. Ballet and capoeira dancers were put in an fMRI scanner and shown videos of either ballet or capoeira sequences. The main finding was that the mirror system spanning the premotor cortex to the parietal and temporal lobes, the mirror system was more active when ballet dancers viewed ballet and capoeira dancers viewed capoeira. The researchers interpreted these findings as showing that people use their own motor experience and expertise to understand others' actions. So it seems that it's much easier to simulate something if you've already mastered it yourself. Since the turn of the millennium, the field of social neuroscience has greatly progressed, and it has gone well beyond mere neurons. Not only that, methodologies have advanced too, allowing for more dynamic questions about how people get in sync with one another in real social interactions. For example, 
Rather than just measuring one person's brain in response to a, a social stimulus, we can now simultaneously measure the brain activity of multiple people engaged in a joint activity. One of the first studies to pull this off was done in 2011 by Ullman Lindenberger and his team at the Max Planck Institute for Human Development in Berlin. They measured the EEG activity of pairs of guitarists playing short melodies together. Recall that EEG uses electrodes on the scalp to record different electrical frequencies emitted by the brain. At any given time, there are many different frequencies of brain waves, with cognitive activity occurring mostly within the, the 0 to 14 hertz range. The idea was to simultaneously measure the cognitive EEG activity of both guitarists as they played together. The more their brain waves became aligned in phase and frequency, the more neurally in sync they would be. The main finding was that the two guitarists synchronized their brain waves not only when they were playing together, but also just before they began to play. The most synchronized activity, the frequency range, was about 2 to 8 hertz, a range associated with voluntary control of motor actions. This means that brains of the guitarists were on the same page, so to speak, even before they started playing. Now, this doesn't show that neurosynchrony is the cause of playing in sync with one another. Perhaps things like mutual eye gaze, head nods, and foot tapping to a beat are what synchronize their brains before playing and, and while they played. But at the very least, this innovative study shows that brain synchrony is a valid neural marker of jointly coordinated social interactions. So if neurosynchrony is not the cause of social coordination, what is? We have one answer from an ambitious project that measured brain synchrony in a high school classroom, a real classroom, over the course of a whole semester. David Poppel and his team at the Max Planck Institute for Empirical Aesthetics in Munich. The Max Planck has lots of institutes. Poppel and his team had 12 students and their teacher all wear portable EEG headgear over the span of 11 sessions of a biology class. There were a number of interesting findings, but the most relevant concerns the alpha frequency of brain waves, around 8 to 12 hertz. Alpha, alpha reflects how deeply someone is paying attention. This simultaneous alpha frequency of all 12 students and their teacher was most synchronized when they reported being more cognitively and socially engaged in class. This suggests that a common focus of attention may be what unites